This is the equator, a belt circumnavigating the Earth where the sun strikes with uncompromising intensity. It's the point where our planet absorbs more solar energy than anywhere else. Unfortunately though, it's also dominated by ocean. Each day, the tropical ocean stores energy equivalent to more than 170 billion barrels of oil. And so, as demand for renewable power is rising, and failing to meet ambitious targets, the question is, can we harness it? And no, this is not a video about floating solar. Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion, or OTEC, is a form of renewable energy that uses the temperature gradient between warm surface water and cold deep water to generate electricity. Essentially, the ocean's one massive battery, and OTEC can provide the connection, producing clean baseload power 24-7 all year round. But there is a catch. In the 2025 IEA report on renewables, OTEC wasn't even mentioned once, which is strange for a resource that a 2025 study suggests could practically meet at least a quarter of current global power demand. The question then begs, where is it? I think the problem, a big part of the problem is widespread ignorance of the technology. In the early days, the technology was deemed commercially unviable, but new advances in technologies like heat exchangers and pump technology are pushing OTEC back up to the surface. And proponents now highlight its potential beyond electricity, supporting integrated systems for water, food and economic development. It's even been put forward for symbiotic systems for, dare I say it, hydrogen production. Organizations, companies, and other interests ranging from uh, traditional uh, crude oil producers to now the huge uh, uh, photovoltaic industry, they don't want, they don't want OTEC as a competition, <laughs> as a competitive uh, clean energy because, mm. uh, and, and here you have you, people talking about, oh, there's no magic bullet for uh, global warming and for generating electricity. Well, I, I disagree. I it sounds convincing, but is the optimism justified? And what would be the consequences of putting systems like these into our oceans? I'm Luke, and you're watching The Upshift. So the theory of OTEC is really quite simple, and that's kind of the beauty of it. OTEC relies on a simple Rankine cycle, which is the same thermodynamic cycle used in a conventional steam power plant. The only difference with OTEC is that it operates under much lower temperatures, and so instead of steam or water, we need a different working fluid, which is typically something like ammonia, or propene, or propylene. Okay, so how does this work in practice? We said that OTEC relies on the fact that in the ocean, you have different temperatures. You have warmer surface water at the surface, which is heated by the sun, and much cooler water as you go deeper into the ocean. And so the way OTEC works is you can take this warmer surface water and use it through a heat exchanger to warm up a working fluid, something like ammonia, as we said. And this will cause the ammonia to evaporate from a liquid into a gas or boil. And that gas can then be expanded through a turbine, which can generate electricity. Of course, though, if we want this to work in a cycle, we need a way to condense our gaseous ammonia now back into a liquid. And so, as you can see, we have another heat exchanger. And so we can take that much cooler water from much deeper in the ocean and run that through another heat exchanger, which will condense our ammonia, which is a gas, back into a liquid. And we can then pump that back into our evaporator, which is the heat exchanger that's boiling the ammonia in order to continue the cycle. Now, this theory allows us to see why OTEX really only suitable in a few certain countries around the world. And this is because it's only really in the tropics and the subtropics where you have a big temperature difference between the surface ocean water and the deep ocean water all year round. In order for OTEC to be viable, we need a temperature difference of around 20 degrees between the surface water and the deep ocean water. Now this means that OTEC offers a massive opportunity to small island nations who typically depend on fossil fuel imports for their energy generation, and instead offers them a path to sustainable local development. The concept was first proposed in 1881 by Jacques d'Arsonval, and the concept was later proven in the early 1930s with the construction of the first OTEC plant in Cuba. While the principle was simple, achieving commercial success or viability was a much greater challenge. 
The early critics of OTEC claimed that it would be impossible to generate enough electricity to satisfy simply the power required for pumping the water through the system. In the US, interest was renewed, particularly during the administration of President Jimmy Carter, who was a former submariner, and he believed that the resource could help the US achieve energy independence. Another reason for interest, particularly within the US military, was the fact that the US had um, some army bases in these tropical regions, um, and so having a reliable energy source was something that could be valuable. Okay, so the US government invested over $260 million into OTEC research from the mid-1970s to the early 1980s, and this culminated in integrated system pilot projects. The first net power, for example, was produced by the mini OSEC plant at Keyhole Point in Hawaii, which produced 50 kilowatts of power and consumed 40 kilowatts. So if you can do the maths, it produced only a net output of 10 kilowatts, but at least it had proved that was possible. As I said, Japan was also quite involved in OTEC at this time, and the Nauru land-based 100 kilowatt OTEC project was operational between 1982 and 1984, built by the Tokyo Electric Power Company. Okay, so what this period proved was that OTEC was technologically feasible, but still not economical. The technology entered what in business terms is called the valley of death, where a technology ends up in this rut between being technologically proven, but not having the financial resources to make it um, a commercial reality. Today though, technical developments have led to improvements in OTEC cycles and heat exchanges, shifting the net OTEC equation. Whilst in the early research, about 70% of an OTEC plant's power output was used to physically pump the water around the system, nowadays we can actually extract about 70% net power. And then there's also a 105 kilowatt system in Hawaii run by the Natural Energy Laboratory of Hawaii Authority, or NELHA. Now, one of the reasons for the inertia around getting OTEC commercialized is the fact that it really benefits from economies of scale. In order for OTEC to be commercially competitive, it has to be a plant of sufficient size, estimated at a minimum of 10 megawatts, but ideally 20 megawatts. Because it's not cost effective to build capacity incrementally, a much larger initial expense is required. And this is what holds developers back, because they essentially have to invest lots of money into a technology that hasn't really been proven yet. When thinking about implementing this in practice, there are really two routes the technology could take. First, we have onshore systems which are built on land but with big long pipes reaching into the ocean to access the seawater. On the other hand, people are also developing offshore systems which are essentially floating platforms that run the pipes straight down into the water. And as you can imagine, these pipes don't have to be quite as long because you can literally go vertically down um, towards the seabed. Now for this reason, offshore systems are economically preferred because it's much cheaper to just run a power cable to shore rather than running these huge pipes into the ocean. And for an onshore plant, the piping alone can account for as much as half of the plant cost to give you an idea. But it's not quite as simple as that. What we haven't spoken about yet is that deep ocean water is actually an incredibly valuable resource in its own right. So deep ocean water is this layer in the ocean that sits below about 200 meters. And the key thing about deep ocean water is that it sits below the phototropic layer, which means that it's not exposed to sunlight. The sunlight simply can't penetrate through that deep. And this resource is massive. More than 90% of the ocean is estimated to be deep ocean water. Now, since there's no light, small microorganisms that rely on sunlight, like algae and phytoplankton, which consume nutrients, don't grow there. And so nutrients accumulate rather than being used up. Organic matter from dead marine organisms sinks and decomposes at these depths, releasing nitrates, phosphates, silicates, and trace minerals like magnesium, calcium, and iodine into the water. Example of where the nutritional content of deep ocean water is perhaps most valuable is in these areas of natural upwelling. So these are areas where, for example, you have undersea mountains which force the deep ocean water back up into the surface. Um, and usually around these sites, you have enormous congregations of fish and marine life. It's estimated that about 50% of the seafood we consume is generated by this natural upwelling. Today, uh, the current uh, f uh, fishing fleets use those old whaling maps because the whales went to where there were natural upwelling. 
And it's not just that, but the other valuable benefit of deep ocean water is that it's also really cold. And that means that it's often free from pathogens which would be unable to survive at those temperatures. Now, we also mentioned this plant in Japan, which is currently operational on Kumajima Island. And the interesting thing about this plant is that it uses a deep ocean water source that was actually already there before the plant was built. Established in 2013, the facility uses deep ocean water and surface ocean water from the Okinawa Prefecture Deep Ocean Water Research Center to produce renewable energy. And since 2010, it's estimated that Kumajima's access to deep ocean water has supported 18 deep ocean water related companies, more than 300 jobs, and 24 to 13 million US dollars per year in local revenue, which would make it the island's largest single industry. As for where the deep ocean water is used, it ranges from aquaculture, so providing temperature stable, nutrient rich water for prawn and sea grape farms, to cosmetics, so there's a company on the island called Point Puru that makes moisturizers and lotions using the minerals found in deep ocean water and now exports globally. It's also used for coral research, so the cooled temperature of deep ocean water can be used to lower surface water temperatures to support coral nursery projects cost effectively. And then it's also being used in algae and food. So Roto Pharmaceutical, a company, uses deep ocean water to cultivate different species of microalgae, leading to beer and food products. And so the idea is that what if we could combine an OTEC plant with this hugely valuable deep ocean water industry and somehow share the costs across that to reduce the overall upfront costs for the plant? And it's not just the deep ocean water itself that could be valuable, but people have also linked OTEC to potential symbiotic projects involving desalination and hydrogen production. Now, the way experts envisage these shared systems working is in what's called a cascade model. So the idea is that deep ocean water is used through multiple stages. So you might take water, say at six degrees, use it for OTEC, and then it might have raised the temperature for 14 degrees, which of course is not cool enough anymore for OTEC, but you could use it then for something like aquaculture, where it might exit at about 15 degrees, where you could use it in secondary industries that need that cooling or need the nutrients in deep ocean water, um, and so on, until eventually you end up with a nutrient depleted warmer water that you could then release back into the ocean. This cascading approach therefore maximizes utilization and reduces waste, but also gives a way to not be releasing this cold deep ocean water back into the surface where it could perhaps start to play with local ecosystems. Okay, so I'm sure you're all probably wondering how much this actually costs, and there are various estimates out there. One estimate from some conference proceedings, which I'll reference here, estimates that a one megawatt OTEC plant on Kumajima would have a capital cost of 24 million US dollars, but that would be just the plant. And once you take into account the intake pipe running into the ocean, that would add an extra 20 million US dollars onto the cost, so about 50% of the total capex. And this is where finding ways to spread out that capital cost of the pipe infrastructure accessing the deep ocean water between all the industries that might want to use that deep ocean water could be really valuable. And this is what's called the Kumajima model. So the table given estimates that if the pipe cost were to have to be fully funded by the OTEC operator, it would lead to a total power generation cost of around $0.238 per kilowatt hour compared to $0.145 per kilowatt hour if the pipe was treated as shared infrastructure. Now, to compare this with current electricity rates in the region, the Okinawa Electric Company commercial rate is about $0.2 per kilowatt hour. The cost of geothermal energy in Japan averages around $0.32 per kilowatt hour, and offshore wind in Japan has a cost of around $0.228 per kilowatt hour. And so you can see that this could have the potential to provide cost-effective energy generation for that island of Kumajima. There are other cost projections though, so Sea Solar Power is another big company in the industry, and they estimate that a 20 megawatt prototype would produce electricity at a levelized cost of energy of 0.22 US dollars per kilowatt hour, dropping to about 0.13 US dollars per kilowatt hour for subsequent units. 
Now, solar and wind have become super cheap in the last decade, so competing with these is not going to be easy. A study estimates that solar and wind systems have levelized cost of energy values of $0.118 per kilowatt hour and $0.0714 per kilowatt hour respectively. So you can see that competing with solar is quite a stretch still. But I think at the same time, you also have to think about what you're replacing. Much of these island nations were already depending on fossil fuel imports for their energy use, and so switching to OTEC is already going to be cheaper and less carbon intensive. Okay, so we said it has the potential to compete economically, but are there still any technical challenges? Well, for a start, the biggest technical challenge is probably the sheer amount of water you need for a large-scale OTEC system. It's estimated that each megawatt requires about 2.5 to 3 meters cubed per second of cold water, and scaling this up means that you need extremely large and costly pipes, as we mentioned. Though hybrid HDPE and concrete systems, as well as floating designs, could address this. Just to give you the sense of the scale of the pipes required, though, intake pipe sizes scale dramatically with capacity. For the Kubajiba demo plant, they're currently using 28 centimeter pipes, um, two of them. But for a one megawatt plant, you'd need approximately a 1.5 meter diameter plant. But if you were to go up to a 100 megawatt plant, you'd need roughly a 10 meter diameter pipe. For any system we put into the ocean, we need to think about what the potential ecological consequences of it could be. And whilst experts like Tom say the risks are low, they're not negligible. For a start, there's the risk that pumping large volumes of water might draw in marine organisms. You know that in uh, Hawaii, where they had some pretty big uh, incoming pipes that had been operating for many decades, and they had only one, one fish that was drawn in. A much bigger concern, though, is what ecological effects the artificial displacement of these massive reservoirs of different types of ocean water could have. Like, what could be the effect if you discharged all this deep ocean water straight into the shallow ocean, um, leading to booms of sea life? Like, would that disrupt marine ecosystems? There's also the effect that mixed discharge water may locally alter temperature and density profiles requiring detailed modelling. Then we can also think about what would happen if we were to deploy this at an enormous scale, like the scale people are citing that could meet the quarter of our energy demand. And in this case, the use of widespread OTEC could cool surface waters and weaken the ocean's temperature gradient, um, reducing its long-term efficiency. And this is why, for example, this research paper has highlighted this figure of 5 to 10 terawatts long term, uh, which would prevent overuse and depleting these temperature gradients uh, over millennia. Let's just summarize the benefits that OTEC would be able to offer. For a start, one of the main benefits of OTEC as a renewable power source is that it offers clean, reliable baseload power. So compared to solar and wind, which are intermittent, or even tidal, which is dependable but still intermittent, OTEC offers a power source that is continuously on, with a capacity factor of 90%. This means that the energy an OTEC plant produces is 90% of what it would be if it were to continually operate at its rated power. Combine this with the fact that you've got a simple, low-maintenance design with limited moving parts, um, easy to access components like heat exchangers and turbines, um, a system that's very resilient to disasters like hurricanes or tropical storms, and something that can be scaled and integrated with these deep ocean water industries, it makes a very compelling case. And as a final note, let's just come back to where this resource could really be utilized. And that's in these small tropical island nations who are really going to be the ones most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. It seems like OTEC could be a resource that would really empower them to reduce their dependence on imported fossil fuels, provide energy security, and drive their economic diversification. If you like this video, you might want to check out some of my others on similar topics, like how this company is bringing back flywheel energy storage, or how algae could solve a lot of our problems. As always, I'm Luke. And this was The Upshift.